Grace and peace to you from our triune God. Amen. So about six weeks or so ago, I went with my family to a White Sox game, and it was great. It was so fun to be back in the ballpark. But if any of you have ventured out into the public world the last couple of months, you know that it can be a little weird at first. It was kind of like if you have ever spent time abroad or lived abroad and come back to the U.S. and you go to the cereal aisle at the grocery store and you just can't stop gawking at the variety of cereal that's there. It's like Lucky Charms, Captain Crunch, Grape Nuts. This is incredible. That's kind of what it was like for me at the ballpark when we went. There were so many people to see. There was so much happening. It was exciting. There were multiple fights that broke out in the bleachers. People got the wave going in the stadium. Someone was carried off the field on a stretcher. It was both awesome and very weird to take it in all at the same time. And take it in is what I did. I sat and I watched and I listened and I soaked it in. I cheered when I was supposed to, and I jumped up and screamed at the home runs, and I sang, take me out to the ball game. Really, all that was missing was for me to land on the Jumbotron camera and be projected up there on the big screen for me to have been the perfect fan. The perfect fan. Kind of like Herod in our Bible story today. Herod was a sort of local governor of Galilee, and he was a fan of the Jesus movement or the John the Baptist movement. Back in the day when there wasn't this 24 hour news cycle, it was a little tough to keep the two straight, Jesus and John the Baptist. John had been around longer, you know, preparing the way for Jesus and all that. And he was eccentric with his camel skins and his locusts and wild honey. People couldn't get enough of him. And Herod was a savvy enough politician that he probably paid attention to whoever was popular. And then John won him over and Herod himself was pulled in. Was John a great speaker? Maybe. Scripture says the crowds flocked to him. Who was this guy who talked about turning towards God, the kingdom of God drawing near, being made right with God? Herod was enchanted. John piqued his curiosity and made him think. Herod liked to listen to him, scripture tells us. What was it? Was it that John told a truth that was so spot on that even if it was uncomfortable to hear, it was fascinating and magnetic? That is, until John's critique honed in on Herod himself. You see, Herod, being Herod, decided he wanted to marry his brother's wife, Herodias. And he did it because he was Herod and he could do whatever he wanted, break the law, get away with it. But when John called him out on his wicked behavior, that's when things started to get real. Herod knew he could have executed John right then and there easily. Who knows why he didn't? Was he playing politics? Maybe. He certainly does at other different points in scripture. The only clue that the Bible gives us is that Herod liked to listen to John. He admired John. He was a fan. So instead of executing him, he stuck him in prison to keep him close, yet send a message. Herod's new wife, Herodias, was not a fan of John. Here she was getting moved around like a chess piece between men, probably getting critiqued, probably the butt of gossip and jokes, and no power to do or say anything about it. So the night came of Herod's fabulous birthday party. No expense was spared. Every dignitary from the land was invited. Dish after fabulous dish was carried out to the guests. The wine was flowing, the music was playing, and Herodias' daughter, so that would be Herod's daughter or niece or grandsister or something like that, <laughs> hard to say. Anyway, she gave a beautiful dance for the guests and Herod was delighted. Perhaps he'd had a little too much wine. Perhaps the mood was a little too merry at the party. And he told the girl that he would give her anything she wanted. Oh, to have that kind of power, like a god, to give the kid anything she wanted. I'm sure the guests were delighted. What should I ask for? She asked her mother. And Herodias, perhaps hungry for a sense of agency, perhaps tired of gossip, maybe just vengeful, 
told her daughter, ask for that truth teller's head on a platter. So the girl asks for it. It's horrible. Now, while Herod is a fan of John and admires him greatly, fact is, the truth of John's message hadn't sunk in. You can almost see Herod there considering the girl's request, drumming his fingers on the table, all the silent eyes staring at him, wondering what he's going to do. The Bible says he was deeply grieved, but he does it. Scripture says he played politics out of regard for an oath to his guests. Herod saves face. Herod's not going to be embarrassed. Herod doesn't apologize. And he executes John, the truth teller, the prophet, the voice calling out in the wilderness, and he has his head brought in on a platter. Herod couldn't say no. He couldn't say no. He couldn't do it. When the rubber hit the road and he had to call the decision, he couldn't repent. He couldn't abandon the status quo. He couldn't embrace being powerless, being less than, being humbled. He couldn't walk the walk. And he ordered John's execution. Roman Catholic Father Richard Rohr writes about the difference between knowledge on ice and knowledge on fire. A lot of us, he says, have knowledge on ice could be an intellectual understanding of God. We're fans, I like that Jesus guy, I'm pro-love. But we haven't always experienced knowledge on fire or let ourselves experience it so that we really trust God. Richard Rohr writes that there's a difference between talking about transformation and talking about God's love and actually stepping out in confidence and living a loving life. To actually do it. There's a difference between being a fan of Jesus and a follower of Jesus. Between being an admirer and a devotee. Between being an audience and a congregation. Between being a spectator at the game and a disciple. It was true back then for Herod, and probably true for a lot of people back then, and it's true for us today. Now, before you stress out, if you're a fan or a follower of Jesus, I'll say that we are all fans of Jesus. That's how we all start. Something in us is a fan of Jesus. And something in us is searching and looking and doing our best to follow him. That's why we're in church today, or that's why we're listening to this message right now, right? I find myself in both camps all the time. So how do we move from admiring Jesus to actually living the Jesus way? How do we heat up our knowledge on ice? What is it that fans the flame and sets our knowledge on fire and guides us to walk the walk? The disciples in scripture were demoralized at the foot of the cross. They had internalized Jesus' teachings, but when he was crucified, they were lost. They were undone without him until he began showing up, that is. First, it was the actual resurrected Jesus. And then Jesus showed up in the way they cared for each other in the early church, in the way they included excluded people, the way they shared what they had and poured their hearts into blessing the world. And those disciples, the book of Acts says, were transformed into, and I, I love this, people who are turning the whole world upside down scripture says. Now, just like Jesus showed up in their lives, the lives of the, dis the disciples and the early apostles, Jesus also shows up in our lives. Maybe as someone has taken care of you or your kid or your family, when you've walked in the valley and, and you've been overwhelmed with the gift, maybe you've been accepted even when you felt very unlovable and it brought you to tears. Maybe you've been forgiven and the flood of grace brought you to your knees. Maybe you had an awakening to how we are all caught in these systems and in these ways of thinking that value certain people over others because of the color of their skin or their sexual orientation or their gender, and you were struck dumb with the realization that you are a part of it. 
Maybe it was someone who simply reminded you that you are not alone in this world, whatever the ups and downs of life may be. All of these are instances of God showing up. They are holy moments, encounters that derail us. The question is, will we let God's truth or God's love hit us deep at the core of who we are and change us and set us straight on the path of following Jesus? Or, like Herod, do we try and shake off the truth and ignore it, water it down, and maybe head back to business as usual? Maybe you have been pushed by Jesus to your limit and you're comfortable where you are. You've considered things and grown and changed and all that and you're feeling good and comfy right where you are right now. Well, my question to you today is where you find yourself a comfortable spectator, can you take one more step towards generosity, towards open heartedness, towards serving someone, towards self-acceptance, towards activism, towards grace? Yes, God piques our curiosity. God tugs at our hearts. God calls our attention. God did it to Herod. But we are called to be more than spectators of God. We are called to roll up our sleeves, to get in the game, and to pour our hearts into this vision of God's kingdom on earth. The path of Jesus isn't always the easiest path. It's a path that says that service is more powerful than edicts, that justice is more powerful than money, that compassion is more healing than getting ahead. And it's a path that will, as the book of Acts says, turn the whole world upside down as it remakes us in God's precious image. St. Teresa of Avila wrote, Christ has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks with compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes, you are his body. Christ has no body but yours. No hands, no feet on earth, but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks with compassion on this world. Christ has no body on earth, but yours. Blessed be the journey. Amen.